Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. In this video, I'm going to introduce to you some of the architecture of Direct 3D. Now, like the comm video, this is going to be a lot of background theory, and you don't need to fully digest all this info right now, but I want to expose you to it anyways before we jump into the D3D code. And as long as you can sort of nod your head semi-understandingly during at least some of the video, you should be good. Uh, you might also want to revisit this video after we've covered a bunch of the basics of Direct 3D setup and rendering, and a lot of it will click a lot better the second uh, view around. All right, so D3D it generally has an object-oriented architecture. It's built on COM, right? Uh, with objects representing the different entities in the 3D rendering system. For example, the shaders, the textures, the states, whatever. And the mother of all these objects is device. Here she is in all her glory. And this represents the, uh, the logical graphics card, the graphics adapter. And this logical graphics adapter can be backed by an actual physical device interfaced to with a uh, hardware driver, or it could be backed by a software emulation layer. Now we use the device object to create all the objects uh, that we need for rendering that allocates resources as necessary. So we can use the device object to create the swap chain, to create buffers like vertex buffers, textures, uh, state objects for storing rendering states of the pipeline, shaders, you know, vertex shaders, pixel shaders, etc., etc. Create all this stuff from the device. And then these objects created by device, many of them can be used to create uh, further objects. For example, a swap chain generally contains multiple frame buffers and you can uh, create objects to get access to those individual frame buffers that are aggregated in the swap chain. Also many resources, it's possible to get views on those resources and those views can be used to bind the uh, resource to the shader pipeline now the device object itself, it's created with a factory function that Direct3D provides called Direct3D11 create device. And you get your device object and to get the swap chain, there's a little bit of hanky panky that goes on here. You've got a query interface to a DXGI interface and then you do a bunch of bullshit and you get your swap chain. That hanky panky looks like this, by the way. You, uh, you query interface on your device to get a DXGI device interface. And then from that you get a parent which is the adapter. And then from that, you get the, the parent of that one, which is the factory, and then you can use the factory to create your swap chain. It's a lot of hanky-panky. By the way, I guess this should be IDXGI device, but it actually doesn't matter because there is another function that allows you to create the device and the swap chain and something else all in one fell swoop. And that's what we'll be using. It's called D3D11, create device and swap chain. But before we talk about that, we should probably talk about what the hell is a swap chain, right? Uh, now, swap chains are essential to all graphics. It's how the pixel data actually gets onto the monitor and thus to your eyes. Uh, so in general, the way raster graphics works is you have a block of memory in your video RAM. You call that the frame buffer, and that holds the color values for all the pixels that you want to be, you want to be displayed on the screen. And what the graphics adapter does, it scans through these pixel values row by row and reads them out into a format, the interface format like HDMI, and those get sent to the display and then this display will write them row by row into the physical pixels, it will illuminate those pixels. And when you reach the bottom row, you go back up here and you start it all over again. Same with this, start over again over here. Now in the old days, something called a RAM DAC would convert binary values in your frame buffer to an analog signal that would control an electron beam that was swept across a display surface made of phosphorus. Now modern displays don't have that setup, but they still have to update row by row or sometimes in another pattern. So what's the consequence of this? Now let's examine what exactly happens if you try to draw directly to this frame buffer. The graphics adapter is continuously scanning the memory of this frame buffer and pushing that data out to the monitor. Uh, so while it's scanning, let's say it scans and it's at this point here in scanning, and then we draw this triangle. Triangle isn't going to appear in that frame because you started drawing it after the scan had reached this point. Uh, so that's not going to appear in the out output frame. Scan is here now. Now let's say you draw 
the circle. It doesn't take very long, so the scan doesn't proceed very much. So now when it scans, it is going, this one is going to appear all the way out on the screen. And then let's say after that you draw the red into the frame buffer, but it's not going to make it out here. So in this frame, only one of the objects that you drew actually made it onto the output frame. And it depends on where the, uh, how long it takes to draw each of these objects, the order you draw them in, and where the scan started, depending on what is going to happen, what's going to be output to the screen. So you're going to have objects in one frame, they're not there, in the other frame, they're there, in the next frame, they're only half drawn, and they're going to flicker like this, it's going to look like complete garbage. This is called single buffering, and we don't use it. We never use this because obviously it's complete garbage. So what's the solution? Now the solution to this problem is to use a double buffering system. So now you have two frame buffers, the front buffer and the back buffer. The front buffer is what the adapter is going to be scanning and sending out to the LCD. The back buffer is where you do your actual work. So the front buffer only ever contains a finished scene. And you never touch the front buffer directly, you just allow the graphics adapter to scan that and send it to the LCD. And so it's very stable, it's never changing really um, during that scanning process. And the back buffer is where you do all your rendering, you build up your scene, drawing it object by object, but the user will never see that process of drawing it object by object, there'll never be any flickering, because this is never shown until it is complete. And when you've completed a frame on your back buffer, then you do what's called a presentation. You present that to the front buffer. And that could be a simple copy, copying the pixels very quickly. Or you can do something called a flip, which is to say, you basically just rename your buffers. So when you when the back buffer is ready, you rename it to front, and then you rename this one to back. And now this one is the one that is going to be jammed out to the LCD. And this one is now the one you're going to write to. This is called a flipping presentation. You flip between back and front. But copy is also very common. It depends on your hardware and your, your setup, which one is going to be used. It's not that important. Now this is much better. It re removes that flickering and a lot of bullshit that you're going to get if you draw directly to the front buffer. But there's still an issue, something called tearing. Whereas if you present, let's say the graphics adapter is halfway through scanning a frame and then you do a flip. So it's going, what's going to go out to the LCD is half of frame zero and then half of frame one and they're going to be jammed together. And at the, at the interface between those two sections, you're going to see something called tearing. And the solution to that is only do your flip when you've completed a full frame. So when you've gone ex from the top to the bottom, and you're now moving to start a new frame, there's a small gap there in time. And during that gap in time is when you would want to do your flip or your copy. That's where you want to do your presentation. And that's what we're going to do. And the Direct3D has options to set that so that it will automatically time the flipping to happen when you want it to happen. And in general, that's a blocking uh, thing. So when you're finished, when you finished a frame, maybe scan this frame here is only scanned down this far. So you would have to wait for it to finish scanning out the previous frame before you would flip. And that would just stall your application a little bit. And there are ways of um, mitigating that because that stalling, some frames take longer than a single monitor refresh. Some take shorter and uh, that'll cause a stuttering to happen where you'll skip some frames. And you can mitigate that to a certain degree by adding another buffer, so you can do triple buffering, and that smooths out the difference between the time it takes to render different frames. Uh, but that also adds latency, so the more frames you add, the smoother you can uh, get your stuttering, but also the more latency you add. But that's that's neither here nor there. We'll maybe, dis we'll maybe cross that bridge when we come to it later on. All you need to know is that the swap chain is an aggregation of frame buffers and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing double buffering with uh, vsync which means we're going to wait for it to finish one scan before we present so that we have no tearing but yeah dxgi can be used to create a swap chain and then we would generally get the back buffer out of that and we would create a render targeting target from that and we would bind that render target to the pipeline and that's what the pipeline would draw all of its work to. So this has come up a couple times already in this discussion here, DXGI. So what is this? How does it differ from Direct3D? 
basically the idea of DXGI is it's factoring out a bunch of uh, functionality from Direct3D that doesn't change as quickly as Direct3D changes. So the, I the idea is that stuff like uh, enum enumerating hardware devices, checking to see what devices are on the system, presenting, rendering frames, controlling gamma, that sort of stuff doesn't really change from version to version in Direct3D. It doesn't change between Direct3D 11 and Direct3D 12. So instead of duplicating that functionality in Direct3D 10, 11, 12, all that stuff, it's factored out into its own subsystem. And then Direct3D 10 and 11 and 12, they all depend on DXGI for some of those low-level behaviors, like presenting rendering frames to an output, which is basically the job of the swap chain, which is why the swap chain is created using DXGI. Now, like I said, you could use Direct3D Create Device to create your device, and then you could do this hanky-panky to create your swap chain. But what we like to do is we like to call Create Device and Swap Chain, get that all at once. Uh, now, there's a bunch of things that you can configure when you're creating the device and swap chain. So you can choose your adapter. If the if the system has multiple graphics cards, you can choose which one you want to be working with. And I might cover that process later on, but for the time being, we're just going to let the system choose the default one. That's probably the best bet for us right now. You can choose your driver type. There's different types of drivers. Um, the main one is, of course, hardware driver, and that will be for hardware 3D acceleration. But there's also a reference driver, which is a software driver that supports every direct 3d feature and supports it correctly without any bugs or errors so it's very good for uh, testing the correctness of your program as uh, using reference driver and there's also a warp driver which is a fast software driver and this might be good for those of you who have a very old graphics card and that doesn't support all the features we'll be using this series you might be able to follow the tutorials even with that old hardware if you use a warp driver. But for the most part, we're going to be sticking with uh, the hardware driver, right? Because that's what we're doing here, hardware 3D acceleration. Now, one of the main things that you specify when you're creating the device is the D3D feature level. And this is, a, this is something that confuses people, so I want to make this clear. Even though we are creating a application that targets Direct3D 11, that doesn't mean that we need a Direct3D 11 graphics card. So you can write a Direct3D 11 application, but if you limit the features, the hardware acceleration features that you're using, you can make it compatible with Direct3D 9, and then when you ask for uh, to create a device, you can say, you know, okay, I, I accept Direct3D 9 feature level. And you can actually give a list of what feature levels you are willing to accept. And then when it creates the device, it'll create the highest one that exists on the system. And then after your creation is finished, you can check to see what feature level you got and choose your shaders and stuff depending on what feature level you're working with. So yeah, don't get feature level confused with SDK version. If I target SDK version 11, that means that the user just has to have updated their DirectX uh, software that's installed on their machine to, you know, version 11 or 11.1. .1. But it doesn't say anything about what's required of the graphics card, whereas the feature level is talking about the graphics card. Also here uh, in flags, you can give some other options. And among those, the most important is the ability to create a debug device. Uh, we'll be doing that a lot because it gives us a lot of information when things go wrong. If you don't create your device with debug, you get very little diagnostics. All right, one last topic here and then we're done this video. So I said that Direct3D create device and swap chain creates our device, creates our swap chain, it creates one more thing. And that thing that it creates is called the context, device context. And this is a very important object that we're gonna be using. Uh, so what does it represent? Well, it represents the graphics adapter. And you might be saying, doesn't device already do that? Yes, but these guys are like two sides of the same coin. So device is used basically for allocating resources and you know creating these different objects. Context is used for issuing rendering commands and uh, configuring the rendering pipeline. So device is used all for setup bullshit and context is used for the actual drawing. Now the context that you get out of create device and swap chain is an immediate context. There's two 
types of contexts, immediate and deferred. And for the most part, in the beginning, we're going to be working exclusively with immediate context. So you don't need to worry about what a deferred context is, but just to give you a little word or two about it, immediate context, when you call a function on it, it will immediately execute that against the hardware. A deferred context allows you to build up a list of commands and then issue them to the immediate context uh, when your command list is finished. So deferred contexts are definitely great for uh, if you want to do multiple threads that are working, they can all build up their commands and then you can put them all into the immediate context and render that stuff out. For the most part, they present the same interface. You can think of them as polymorphic children of the same base class. Uh, but one thing that immediate context can do that deferred is can't do is it can query the graphics driver. So if you do a command that queries the state, you can get information. Obviously, deferred context can't query because deferred context only builds up a command list that is executed sometime in the future. So those are the main differences between these guys. But like I said, deferred context, we're not going to be dealing with this uh, for a while, so you can forget about it for now. Just know that immediate context is how you issue rendering commands, uh, how you set up the pipeline, and how you query the, uh, the graphics adapter, particularly with uh, reference to the pipeline. And that's it. Of course, there's a lot more to the architecture of Direct3D. I haven't even really described the pipeline at all, but... Uh, this information is going to be particularly pertinent in the next few videos where we are writing the code to actually initialize the Direct 3D system. And like I said, don't worry if you're not clear on most of this stuff. As long as you've heard it at least once, it'll start to make sense in the next video. And after you've gotten a bit of Direct 3D code under your belt, then you might want to even come back and revisit this video, and it might make a lot more sense at that point in time. So yeah, look forward to uh, getting our hands dirty, doing some actual direct 3D coding in the next video. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. And I'll see you soon with some more Hardware 3D. Peace.